Thank you. Welcome to the Roosevelt High School Class of 1972 Veterans Day Affair. First, giving honor to God. Please stand for a moment for our silence for our fallen and wounded soldiers, families, and friends from the recent tragedy in Fort Hood, Texas. our honored guests, all veterans active and retired of the United States of America. Veterans Day is a very special time to recognize, salute, and thank the men and women who have chosen to sacrifice their lives so that we will be protected and secured from our enemies by land, air, and sea. Honoring our nation's veterans, especially our local veterans, means we are fulfilling our promise to them. We're truly blessed to have you, loved ones from Dayton, Ohio, serve our country and return home safely. We have a very short program planned for our honored veterans and a fun-filled evening for you. The live entertainment will certainly move and groove you throughout the evening. It has been a labor of love planning this Veterans Day affair. 
and we look forward to celebrating our Veterans Day again. Throughout the evening, please mingle with our veterans, our heroes, and thank them for a job well done. A very special welcome and thank you to our honored guests, the Ohio Chapter Tuskegee Airmen, for your presence, God bless you, and God bless America. Again, welcome to the Roosevelt High School Class of 1972 Veterans Day Affair. Sit back, relax, and enjoy yourself until it's time for you to go home. At this time, we will have a prayer by our pastor, Cynthia Frost Davis. Oh, real good. <laughs> good evening. Good evening. All right, amen. We're going to ask that you will bow your heads as we go to the throne of Christ. Father, in the name of Jesus, so oh God, we come before you first of all saying thank you. Thank you for who you are and all that you have done. We thank you, O oh God, for all things grand and small. We thank you for this evening, Lord, for this devotion of love and fellowship and appreciation to the veterans. Amen. We thank you, O oh God, for how you have kept them, how you took them across thousands of miles, but yet you allowed them to come home safely. We thank you, Lord. We thank you for the Tuskegee Airmen being with us this afternoon, O oh God. We thank you for the loved ones that have come out this evening to share and to enjoy in the bounty of what they have done for our country. For this, Lord, we say thank you. We thank you, O oh God, for this class of Roosevelt 1972, O oh God. We thank you for allowing them to have the mind to want to do something, O oh God, just to say we thank you. If it had not been for the sacrifices they made, O oh God, we probably wouldn't have a class of 72 here tonight. But we thank you, O oh God, for everything that has been done. We ask, O oh God, that you continue to keep us, continue to nurture us, continue to mature us, O oh God. In the name of Jesus, we ask that you allow us, even upon next year, O oh God, in the years after, that we'll be able to come and give thanks together and appreciate what you have done for us. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Right, at this time, we'll have a presentation of our Community Service Award. Yes, can I get the commander to stand, please? On behalf of Roosevelt High 72, we congratulate you, Commander Arnold Whiteley and Daniel Chappie James, American Legion Post 776, Dayton, Ohio, on receiving this community service award. This award is the highest form of recognition confirmed by the Roosevelt High School Class of 1972. It is an honor and privilege to present this award to you and your post. In many cases, we, we need all reflected in eyes of disabled veterans, the homeless and disadvantaged men, women, and children. Your commitment, dedication, generosity have met the humanity needs of our community. There, there as the men and women of the Daniel Chappie James American Legion Post 776 have demonstrated leadership, humanity, service, loyalty to their post and service of all country with pride and dignity. We, the class of high school, Roosevelt High School, class of 1972, thank you and salute you for your continued generosity to the community and Dayton, Ohio. Good evening. My name is Arnold Watley, and I'm pleased uh, to be standing here today to receive this award. But the work that we do, uh, we don't expect to receive anything back. It's mandated by the American Legion poses that we support all veterans from all wars. And the American Legion Post 776 is proud to step forward and be a leader in that area. I'm also pleased to be here with Tuskegee Airmen's. I spent like about 10 years in Montgomery, but I never had a chance to meet any, any of you. It's a pleasure to see you. 
I would like to introduce some of the family from 776, if I may. Please. We have with us today 3rd District, 2nd Vice Commander, and Adjutant of American Legion Post 776, Stanley Pleasant. <laughs> also with us is our service officer, Sylvester Corley. <laughs> Department of Ohio, past president, Carol T. Robinson. And with the ladies at zero, would you please stand, please? Thank you very much. When Tony Chapman called me and he insisted that I come to this fundraiser, I was not sure I could make it. But when she told me that she wanted me to introduce to you some of the guest speakers I was on. <coughs> well, one of them, the guest speakers is a relative of mine. Not only is he a veteran of World War II, he also belonged to the unit known as the Tuskegee Airmen. So without further ado, I would like to introduce to you the Tuskegee Airmen. <laughs> discrimination because blacks back then were not accepted as equals. So we proudly thank you for what you've done and I'd like to bring forth my uncle, Billy Elmer Ross. <laughs> Alexander for inviting us out this evening so we can give you a brief history on the Tuskegee Airmen and some of their accomplishments and some of the troubles that we had to go through with back at that time. But before I do that, I'm not going to make it very long. Before I do that, I'd like to introduce some of our members, Mr. Robert Harvey, who's a cadet. Mr. Tom Bell and Mr. Benny Bell. Now, what I'm going to try and do to convey to you I want to give you a brief history of how we started to be called Tuskegee Airmen. We weren't always Tuskegee Airmen. This whole program started as a Tuskegee experiment. It was an experimental program that no one thought was going to succeed. So what they did, they decided we'd go ahead and try to see what they could do about it. Now, back in 1938, just before when uh, President Roosevelt was in office, there was some, a, a black newspaper, the Pittsburgh Courier, the Urban League, the NAACP, and the Bellman and Waiters Union were putting pressure on the people in Washington so that they could train black pilots for the Army Air Corps. Because they hadn't been heard of. They didn't want blacks flying airplanes, nor did they think they were smart enough to fly a machine as complicated as an airplane. So, by those people putting pressure on Washington up there at that time, they decided, okay, we'll go ahead and try and see what they can do. Now, they're hoping at the same time that we fail. So we're put, putting pressure on them. But Mrs. Roosevelt and Mrs. Wilkie had a meeting down in Hampton, Virginia. At Hampton School down in with Dr. Hinton, who was the president, and they decided we'll give them a chance along with Mr. Roosevelt. So there was two guys out of Chicago, Chauncey Spencer and Dale White, decided to go to Washington. They flew to Washington and talked to Senator Truman and to Congressman Eric Dirksen out of Chicago. They got on their side and they convinced the War Department and the CAA, which was Civil Aeronautics, and also the United States Army Air Corps, to go ahead and we'll find a place for, to set up this training program. To begin with, they had a program called the CPTP, which was Civilian Pilot Training Program. Now, a lot of universities and colleges had those back during that time. But none of them was being trained to fly for the United States Army Air Corps. So the, they had a college at Delaware State was one of the universities, Hampton Institute, Howard University, North Carolina A&T, and Tuskegee. 
So they were going to decide it on Tuskegee. Now this was the worst place because it was in the South and nobody really wanted it to Tuskegee. But there was a judge up there, Judge Hastings, decided, since we were, since they're going to let us do it, let's do it in Tuskegee. It's better to have it there than not have one at all. So they decided on Tuskegee. So they went down to Tuskegee when the first flying program started at Tuskegee in 1941. But the first class didn't graduate until 1942. Now there, what they planned on doing was giving the primary training, the basic training, and advanced training down in Alabama, but the primary, the basic and the advanced training was going to be at Montgomery Municipal Airport, which is some 80 miles west of there. Because the field they were flying out of down at then was Moulton Field. And a guy by the name of Chief Anderson, Charles Anderson, was teaching the students to fly there. So they got into the CPTP program. Shortly after that, they decided to build by going so far west to try to fly them back to Tuskegee. It was just too expensive, so they decided to build an airfield at Tuskegee, which they did. It was built on a dump. And the company that built it was a black contractor out of North Carolina by the name of McKissick and McKissick. It was a contractor, a, a man and his daughter. They built this down at Tuskegee Army Airfield. In the meantime, while all of this was going on, they had some people training over Snoot Air Force Base. Over at Chinook, these men were being trained to be te te technicians and hydraulic mechanics and stuff like that. Now the communication people were being trained over at Scott Air Force Base in Illinois and the armament people were being trained at, at Lowry Field in Colorado. All of these groups were supposed to come together at one time, which they did in Tuskegee, and form the 99th Pursuit Squadron. They formed this 99th Pursuit Squadron down there and the first squadron graduated down there in 1942. Flying squad in 1942 when he graduated. Now, out of a class of 13 people, there was five of them that actually graduated. It was Benjamin Davis. Now, Benjamin Davis had went to graduate from West Point. And his father, Benjamin Davis Sr., was already in the Army. But when Benjamin Davis Jr. went, he went to his father first and was working for him, but then he transferred when the flying portion started, he transferred to Tuskegee. He was the only officer down there at that time. It was Benjamin Davis, Charles D. Bowl, Lemuel Custis. And, and, and Mac Ross and Benjamin Davis. They graduated in 1942 from Tuskegee. Now, they, the 99th Squadron, with the technicians they had there then, they decided they were going to send them overseas, which they did. They went overseas and formed the 332nd Fighter Group. And as the other people graduated from down in Tuskegee, they joined in overseas. And the first group that hit overseas was up in Fez, Morocco. And they went from Fez up to, 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 to Tunisia. And from Michigan up to Monte Covino. And they got up in Monte Covino and they flew all their missions, missions out of Monte Covino. As these other groups graduated from Tuskegee, which was, a, there was, there was 950 graduated from Tuskegee, 450 of those men went overseas, 66 was killed, and 35 of them were prisoners of war. They come back to the United States. Now, when these groups graduated, they formed four squadrons. Overseas, it was the 99th, the 100th, 301st, and the 302nd fighter group. That was the only fighter group in the United States Army Air Corps that had four fighter squadrons. And the reason that being was the white groups didn't want them, so they had to group them all together. And all of their missions were flown out, out of Monte Casino. And what made the 99th so proud of themselves over there? That one day they went on a mission. They flew 1,500 missions and 15,000 sorties. One day they went on a mission and they heard somebody, a lot of chatter on the radio, want to know what was going on, what's all that chatter about the Germans were shooting them out there. Now, the, and what happened, as they did this, they heard this chatter and the 99th was coming back off of a mission. So they went and to where these bombers were flying back. Now, what happened to that fighter escort, don't nobody know. But they didn't meet them at the IP, which was the initial point where they flew, was going in and they, they tried to go outside until they get ready to fly out. So these fighter pilots start guarding them, bringing them back. They knock the Germans off of them. When they got back, they wanted to know who's those guys flying in planes with the red tails. They says a bunch of black folks over there, Negroes as we would call them, flying them airplanes. They said, it can't be. We ain't got no Negroes flying airplanes over here. No way. So they got in a little jeep and they poked it on up there to the base and sure enough, when they got there, there's a bunch of Negroes flying airplanes. And don't you know, from that day on, they wanted the Negroes to escort them on their bombing missions, which they did, and they never lost a bomber, as long as they were escorted. Now, we know, about, we know about the 99th and the 332nd Fighter Squadron, but there's something that you don't know, probably, some, a lot of you, that was also a bomber group. 
the 477 medium bomber group that had a 616, 617, 618 bomber squad. This group trained, was activated in 1944 self field missions. Never went overseas because the war was in, so they had no need for them. But under this group, they had a commander by the name of Colonel John Selwyn, who was the base commander, and this was under the 1st Air Force out of New York, who had a general by the name of General Henry. Now these were two stone segregationists, let me tell you. If anybody was one of the segregationists, they should have met them too. When they activated the 477 up in Selfridge Field, Michigan in 1944, he moved. Now Selfridge Field was a base where they had plenty of room, apron, the aprons were big enough to park the aircraft on, the fuel storage tanks were big enough and everything. But he moved them over to a place in Indiana called Freedom Field in Seymour, Indiana, back there where the Ku Klux Klan's is. <laughs> When he moved those people over there, now this field was inadequate for their combat training mission because the ramps were smaller, fuel storage tanks were smaller, and everything. But that's where he put them. Also, they had an officer's club on the base. A white officer's club. Now when these black folks got there, they're going to the officer's club too because some of these guys had been overseas fighting and they were combat pilots. And they'd come back and they'd come into Walterboro, North South Carolina. And when they got into Walterboro, they promised them that if you'll go join the 477, you can get promoted. You can get a promoted if you stay in. So some of these black combat pilots did that's how they ended up over at the, over in the Freedom Field, Indiana. Now this white officers club, this commander Selwyn, he wasn't gonna let them go in that white officers club. He said, We'll build you a club, but you can't go in there. So they were determined, we're not going in no club. I don't care if you build it, we're not going in. We're going in this club. And the reason they said that was, it was an army regulation out 210 10 10. No discrimination on the base. None whatsoever. We're not going to have it. We're going to use this officer's club. He closed the club up to keep them from going in there. Put a bunch of them on a C-47 and threw them down to Godman Field, Kentucky, outside of Fort Knox. And put them in these barracks down there, and they put a fence around them. The kicker is, they had Italian prisoners working in the mess hall down there. And these black combat pilots got sent over here with a fence around them. And these Italian people, you can look out the fence, see them walking around over there. And here they stepped in this thing. Benjamin Davis was overseas, so they called for Benjamin Davis to come back to the United States. George Stanky Roberts took his place. When he come back, he commanded the squadron overseas. Benjamin Davis went to Godman Field, took over the outfit. Now nobody knows what happened to Colonel Selway because he disappeared. But Selby, he took over the commander of the 477 fighter squadron down at the Garmin Field, Kentucky. Then the training got better because they started, they stayed at Garmin Field and they got to doing better things. So in 1947, they moved to Lockbourne Air Force Base up in Columbus, Ohio. Now, the first, the services integrated, they had an order, they put an order out in 9981, integrated the military. Now the Air Force knew they were going to integrate. So they didn't wait for the order to come down from Washington. They integrated anyway. And then the Army, the Navy, and the Marines, and the rest of the military service, they, they got integrated in 1949. It's when they were integrated. So when the pilots, all of them integrated and then broke up, up in Washington, up in Columbus, Ohio, Lockport Air Force Base, which they renamed the Rickenbacker now, they sent everybody everywhere. And when they sent them all different bases and everywhere else. So that's just part of the story of the 99th and the 477 medium bomber group. So I'm sorry, I didn't take up no much more of your time, but hopefully you got something out of that, I don't know. And for those of you who don't know, I've got some handouts over here with some of the accomplishments on them. You're welcome to take them if you like. On the back of those handouts over there, it tells you how many planes were shot out, how many missions were flown, and so forth. So with that, I'll leave it with you. Hope you have a good time tonight. song to God be the glory. Thank you is certainly something I must declare to each of you and certainly to Almighty God. Your commitment and dedication to entertaining the veterans was simply outstanding and I am filled with joy, admiration, and pride. Will the reunion committee please stand or wait, wave your hand? Just give them a hand. 
We began this journey six months ago with a vision of doing something positive for a fundraiser. I thought maybe we can salute the veterans of Dayton, Ohio. In November, without a penny in our pockets, Roger said we had $85. Um, we began to make plans for this evening, and here we are today, signed, sealed, and delivered. We are reminded in the spirit of this Veterans Day holiday more than ever before that we must never allow this country's defense be obscured by celebration, but always, always be on guard to protect and serve our country. I would like to thank our many sponsors, families, and friends for all their prayers and support. We could not have done any of this without you. And to the Lady Auxiliaries of the 776 President, Ms. Pat Taylor, thank you for your support. She's also a graduate of Roosevelt, class of 1973. To our honored guest, the Ohio Tuskegee Airmen, thank you for accepting our invitation and blessing us with your presence. And to Mr. Harvey, who did not want to be the guest speaker, he told me to call Mr. C.I. Williams, and he's in Florida as we speak. So he dropped the ball on Mr. Elmer Ross. So thank you, Mr. Harvey. You did something well. Congratulations to the American Legion, Post 776. Chief Buford and the Meadowdale High School ROTC students, thank you so much for your participation in the Color Guard. And to the mighty class of Roosevelt High School, 1972, thank you for your continuous support of me. And as we venture off and get prepared for our 40th class reunion, look forward to us and our future fundraisers. From the words of President Barack Obama, yes, we can. Yes, we can. Thank you very much. Father, in the name of Jesus, oh God, we ask right now that you bless this food tonight, Lord. Bless the hands that prepared it. Let it be nourishment to our bodies. Lord, let it taste good, pass the lips, and leave nothing on the hips. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>
Oh Lord, have mercy, Jesus. Where the hell did you? I didn't do that. I didn't do did that. you do that? No. Yeah. Y'all say the ball here. Yeah. Man, what you got to say about it, like, son? Hey, you know what? Say something. Shame on you. They were doing that to woo woo. Yeah. You hear me? Come on, say something, son.